on TV. Hi, Rick Santoro. Hello, Hello Richard Rick. Santoro. Ah, I'm Ricky! And I am the king! A pepperoni, sausage, Canadian bacon. Listen, why don't you just get the deluxe and save time, all right? Look, I got business. Call me back in five. There he is! There's the man whose life I want! <laughs> And now, the distinguished Secretary of Defense. Great okay. idea. Put a flashing light on your head while you're at it. Why are you so uptight? It's fight night! Run in security tonight. I got a lot on my mind. Watch carefully. That seemed right to you? Kevin, that is right in so many ways. No, I mean a beautiful woman alone at a fight. A crime is about to be committed. Now listen to me, Mr. Secretary. I am telling you, you are the one that's going to be sorry. Guys, we are back with another episode of Brat Spin Reviews. I'm Jared Brat, host and filmmaker. You can find a link to my psychodrama feature film streamer that's in the description below, available to watch on Tubi. Back with me again, co-host, host of the Hey You Made Your Movie show, filmmaker, interviewer, reviewer, Carl Diamond. Glad to be back. I'm glad to be a uh, regular on this now. We're all regulars now. It's official. On this episode, we are talking about Snake Eyes from 1998, directed by master auteur Brian De Palma and fellow regular host, back with us, filmmaker, reviewer, interviewer, Robert Mitchell. Hey guys, it's uh, great to be back and uh, it's going to be awesome to talk about Nick Cage as well. Snake Eyes. I would say this movie came out at a time when Brian De Palma was kind of at the peak of his powers. You just done Mission Impossible, right? Exactly. And that movie was a huge blockbuster hit. I think after Mission Impossible, you could look forward to an annual Brian De Palma mainstream. I mean, I guess you could say blockbusters. To me, Snake Eyes falls into that 90s category of movies we kind of don't get a lot of anymore in terms of mainstream theatrical releases. But Snake Eyes, to me, falls into that category of standalone adult art thriller. Yeah, there's no IP attached to Snake Eyes unless you consider Nicolas Cage his own IP. It's kind of a genre of movie that doesn't exist anymore, or kind of movie that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, I saw this movie in theaters. It was a summer release, I believe. Now, for me, this movie would have been on my radar anyway. The added bonus was that in Montreal, where I'm from, they were shooting Snake Eyes at the hockey arena, the old forum in Montreal. So it was a big deal at the time because it's a huge Hollywood production. Rob, when did you see this movie? I would have saw it a couple of years after on video. My friends and I in our small town, we would go to the movies, but a lot of times our Friday and Saturdays were going to video stores and spending hours there and then renting movies. We definitely would have checked this film out because one thing I found interesting while looking at what was happening at this era was 96 and 97, you have Vander Holyfield and Tyson, some of the biggest boxing matches of all time. And we would uh, always go over to my friend's house and watch some pay-per-view. So the draw for us for this movie would have been definitely Brian De Palma and also the boxing being central to the story. It's interesting because I can recall that the marketing push for this movie was out there. Like this wasn't, they didn't just drop this movie out of nowhere. In fact, this movie to this day stands out to me as one of the first movie trailers where I felt like even back in the day, I'm like, this trailer is showing us way too much of this movie. Like if you go back and watch the movie trailer, it covers everything and pretty much tells you a major twist in the movie with regards to Gary Sinise and how his character turns out to be the antagonist. That is a huge plot reveal there because for most of that movie, it's set up that Gary Sinise is, you know, kind of caught up in this, but he's an okay dude. For me... Even going in knowing that Gary Sinise was going to be the bad guy, it's still a huge moment. It's still a very powerful moment. Even if I knew it was going to happen, but it's like, wow, everything looks different now. And every time you see Gary Sinise, there's tension because, oh, is he going to kill the people? Is he going to kill someone again? It's great. I've always thought that De Palma has too big of a thing for Hitchcock. Like he's like a huge Hitchcock nerd and it shows in everything he does. And sometimes I feel like it gets in the way of his storytelling. He does the Hitchcock techniques, but he doesn't put in enough like suspense wise or tension wise to really keep us focused for those long wonders he has. I'm looking at you, Carlito's way. <laughs> this time, everything about this movie that is Hitchcock inspired works. The Wonners were really good. If not for creating tension, they were there for world building and keeping you in that world and having Nick Cage drag you around and show you what's happening all around him. 
seeing things from different point of views, the same scenes, but from different perspectives. And then the split screen shots, it kept me hooked the entire time. This film really moves at a really relentless pace. My favorite sequence in this movie, it's as good as anything De Palma has done in any of his other movies, but I love the entire sequence that starts. So Gary Sinise, his character Kevin Dunn, is trying to find this redhead in disguise who, according to his story, is a suspicious character that is involved with this assassination that goes down of the Secretary of Defense at this boxing match. Obviously, we find out later that Gary Sinise is part of this entire plot. But he's like, I'm going to go find her. And Nicolas Cage is like, I'm going to go up to the security camera area and look for this other woman who snuck into the boxing match to talk to the Secretary of Defense and give him information regarding faulty weapons testing. It turns out Nicolas Cage on the security cameras finds this woman. And as he finds her and starts to go look for her throughout the casino, Gary Sinise is also on her tail. So it's the two of them tracking her down. And this entire sequence that starts from the casino floor and then Carla Gugino's character, she's got to get out of the arena. She's like, okay, I'll pretend to be a prostitute with some random dude. And they do that. And then the sequence continues. And then you see them go into this random person's room. And then the camera goes aerial. I love in movies when you have people in different rooms and you get to see this overhead shot that shows you everybody in their room, like hamsters in a cage. Spielberg has an awesome sequence like that in Minority Report. Countless other movies, but it's so in De Palma's wheelhouse with his camera work. Just the whole stalking scenario, the music, like you guys said, the pace. To me, that sequence alone is worth the price of rental. Oh yeah, and it happens right after you find out that Gary Sinise is the bad guy. Not only is there a tension, like suddenly you're put into the situation where the target is going to come really close to him. When Nick Cage loses Carla Gugino's character in the elevator, and then, oh, who is in the elevator? Oh, Gary Sinise. But yeah, I agree with you 100%, Joe. That is probably one of the best sequences in the movie. I missed her. You got her in the box? Yeah, Ricky, I got him. I'm taking this elevator. Tell me what floor they're on. So what kind of music do you like? Ow, what? I'm sorry, I just wanted a hug. What floor? 35. What? What? Nothing. I get upstairs. Well, I gotta know what floor. I can't make out the buttons. It's a high one. Can you pick them up when they get off? I'd have to check floor by floor. I'd lose them. Hang on. I get an idea. I will say something that I, I don't think I've seen done in a movie before is uh, the POV shot, but from a perspective of someone who doesn't have their glasses on. And that was really tense for me. I was like, oh, crap. This has a whole other layer to the character and the performance. It's one thing if you were to have Carly Gugino's character running around saying, oh, I can't see with I have my glasses on and she's squinting. You know, the actress can do a great performance, but to see from her perspective that everything's blurry and that things are slowly coming into focus when she gets close to people, all the while knowing she's being hunted is really, really tense. Yeah, that uh, totally adds to the suspense because when she finally approaches that guy who's like, hey, I'm trying to watch this horse race. You don't know if that is somebody that's in pursuit of her or not, because the way it's framed, we're only seeing a piece of that guy's suit. So it really creates even more tension. Carl, when you said that you learned that Gary Sinise is the bad guy Mm -hmm. in the film, part of them, and you said this changes everything. That's what's so great about this entire film is when I was reading about this after rewatching it and then reading some of his interviews and some of the reviews at the time, people are like, well, why did he do this movie after Mission Impossible? This movie was so successful. Why did he go back to his like wheelhouse of filmmaking? I think what drew Brian De Palma into this movie is it's basically Brian De Palma's Rashomon. Ah, yeah. (laughs) Just to comment about that, the idea that, oh, why would Brian De Palma want to go back to this? I mean, are reviewers that thick? (laughs) This is all Brian De Palma wants to do. Yeah. (laughs) Stuff like this. Brian De Palma just wants to be Hitchcock. We're going into the same places, the same arena, the same backroom bar, uh, locker room over and over again. But the way it's shot in those first person shots is uh, spectacular. And we're always learning something new. And when it changes focus, 
I love movies that uh, obviously ultimately at the end of the day a movie is telling a story and that's one thing I love about this movie is there's all these stories being told and we don't know what's true and what isn't we're hearing things from people's perspectives and I absolutely love that you know, we're given this information, but through the character. So we don't know if that's true or not. And all the characters are all dishonest. So it's like, you don't know who's, everyone's a liar, except for Gary Sinise in the beginning. And you're like, oh, you think he's the golden boy. And then he's the biggest liar of them all. That's what's great is there's so many flawed characters in this movie. Including Cage's character, Rick Santoro. I mean, he's our protagonist. He's essentially a corrupt sleazebag of a cop. That's what I love about his entire arc. I mean, this whole movie, when you kind of cut right down to it, it's basically a redemption story for this guy who's just a corrupt burnout. There's that line later on. He's with Carla Gugino's character. There's a bit of a pause where they can just kind of slow down for a bit, and she's kind of catching him up to speed. The fact that she's being chased by his best friend, Gary Sinise. And then she says to Cage, well, are you a cop or aren't you? And it's like, that's the whole crux and decision of his character is this entire movie is, you know, are you a scumbag or are you going to change and redeem yourself? If you want to get more abstract about it, at least what I was thinking about for the first time, and I've seen this movie so many times, that storm going on outside. You know, there's a whole storm that's crashing down on the casino as the movie goes on. But it's like, you could say, well, that storm is a metaphor, right, for like Cage's soul. And as everything gets torn down, ultimately in the end, things get built up and his character will become a new person. I would argue that it's a metaphor. The storm is his life. That whole line in the beginning where Gary Sneeze is like, why are you still doing this cop thing? Why don't you just come with me? I'll get you in political protection gigs. They pay better. And he's like, no, this is my city. It's my sewer. But it's my sewer, Jiminy. And I love it. I kick around about six square blocks. Everybody knows me. I got the whole town wired. Someday if I manage to get my face on TV a few times, maybe I'll run for mayor or something. But that's as far as I want to go. Because I was made for this sewer, baby. And I am the king! Looking at that more metaphorically, he is trying to have his cake and eat it too by being a corrupt cop there's a storm going on in his conscience as the movie goes on he does have a code he kind of breaks it a lot but then when he comes to the point where it's like hey this is a big assassination i am the one who knows a key witness a key part of this investigation and i can flip it either way he has that line carla guccino's character says i'm sorry and he's like oh you're sorry why do you have to bring it to me now i gotta do something i don't want to do that kind of shows where his code hits. Well, are you a cop or aren't you? I can't get past the men at the doors by myself. But with you, I'd be fine. You just, you get me outside. You don't have to think about me again. I can take care of myself. Well, you did a hell of a job so far. Look, I'm sorry if I- Who gives a shit if you're sorry? What are you mad at me for? Because I didn't have to know! You decided to have this problem, not me! My world would have gone on turning just fine, but now either way I look, I have to do something I don't want to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do not want to do this! Do what? Then at the very end, so you have her, let's uh, look at her as a symbol of ethics within Cage. And so he puts her in this place where on one side you have the darkness, which is Gary Sinise coming to kill her. And then the other side, you have the police coming to save her. They're all converging on the same point and the storm pushes the cop car into the gate, which opens up. And so the cops see her as Gary Sinise is coming in, in Cage's heart. If Cage is the stadium and Cage is Atlantic City, that's where good and evil clash. And so I felt like all of it was very metaphorical. One thing I found on that staircase scene, which is obviously pivotal, one of the key scenes in the whole picture, you got Rick and Julia. She's telling him everything. She works for this missile system. She go reviews all the tests and all that. She gives uh, him the whole crux of the matter. And the, the tests are being faked and they're pushing through this missile system that actually doesn't work. One thing I think so uh, great in that whole sequence is she tells Rick, Nick Cage's character, that I saw Gary Sinise's character talking to the shooter. He's in on this. And then, of course, as we've been discussing, like he's like, no, 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 I don't want to deal with this. This is not what I'm doing. This is not who I am. Like she's t basically telling him his childhood buddy who, as you said, like he claims it, he owns it. 
I'm in the sewer, I'm king of the sewer, I want to be mayor of the sewer. He looks up to the Gary Sinise's character. This is a guy that, you know, I could have been that guy, I'm not that guy, but here's a guy that he represents good, he's in a uniform, he's fighting for his country. So she's basically telling him, no, this guy is a bad guy, he's in on this. And then she starts feeling for him in this moment, because she's like, well, he's like, are you sure? And she's like, well, maybe I'm not, which I also love, because it plays into the whole, all the different perspectives and all the lies and the stories that are being thrown around in this movie it's a great moment for cage up to that point you're not sure whether he's intimidating her or if he is trying to be thorough and that moment where he says no 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 you lost your glasses after that point shows that he is on the level he's you know trying to be a good cop in a good detective in that sense and not just trying to cover for his friend yeah i know him and you could be wrong yeah you could there were people rushing in front of you and and you were nervous and you were scared you could be wrong Yes. Isn't it possible? Yes. Isn't it? Isn't it so? Yeah. Now that yeah. I think about it, I, I think I could be wrong. Um, you remember I, I, I told you that my glasses they had fallen off, and I and, and I couldn't quite focus. I, I I don't think it was him. I think your glasses didn't fall off till after the gunshots. Oh, yeah, that's a great point because Nick Cage is a uh, his physicality of an actor in Carla. I mean, already that's an intimidating. He's just looms over her to begin with. I'm glad you just mentioned the physicality because I also think in that staircase scene with what you were just saying, Rob, about one uh, Cage's character realizes that oh fuck, my best friend is actually the culprit in all this, or one of them. Everything is about to change from his demeanor. He's almost grounded. Like, the movie starts, and Cage is a fucking firecracker. I remember reading reviews when this movie came out that were criticizing his performance as being over the top. Which, I mean, he fucking is insanely over the top. It's wonderfully over the top. It's all a choice, like, it's by design, because I love how Cage's character starts over the top. You get to that staircase scene, and even when he sits her down, he busts out his Marlboros, and he's like, Yeah, I'm a cop, baby. I'm here to protect you. He's still in the act of it all, of being his larger-than-life persona, but when he hits that breaking point or that realization that his world is about to be flipped upside down, he gets a lot more subdued, and then to the end of the movie, that high-strung over-the-topness has completely dissolved, and he's this subdued, regular person, at least by just looking at his performance, so yeah, I just love all that. Years later, his style of acting would become a meme and hinder his career for a bit. But in this movie, I think it's very precise and there's highs and lows to his performance, not just him being over the top for the sake of it. The cocaine wears off in that moment. Not saying Nick Cage was on cocaine, but like I think the character, that's the sobering moment where it's like, oh shit, I'm not having fun anymore. <laughs> I gotta go to work. Even up to that point, he's doing the fun cop stuff. It's a power trip. And then it's like, oh shit, now I gotta actually be defender of justice and go after my friend. Something he does not want to do. This is an extremely hazardous... Hang on! The police emergency unit should... I think I see their truck! Atlantic City, I mean, it's not the biggest town. He's pretty high on the hog. He's a corrupt cop taking kickbacks. He gets front row seats at the boxing match. It's his town, and nothing can bring him down until all of this happened. That opening sequence has been written about and talked about a lot, that 20-minute continuous shot. One thing that I noticed in this shot, going back to Nick Cage and his performance, and just the power and the presence of Nick Cage is fascinating. You have this tracking shot. He's walking through. He's on the cell phone with his wife and kid, and there's hundreds of extras behind him, and you're drawn to him. Like, you don't look at all that background action, and it just really spoke to me to the power and the persona of Nick Cage as an actor. And I think we could probably give some props to the costume designer because of the iconic shirt that was in the posters at the time, and he's wearing through half of the movie. Yeah, I love his costume when you first see him and his outfit. It's great. And it's so true about what you say, being just solely focused on his presence and his charisma, because you're right, there are tons of background extras and there's just so much going on i'm thinking about myself now anytime i've watched this movie and it's just i'm laser focused in on what cage is doing first off i don't know about you guys but i like looking at the background extras to see like what the hell is this person doing but anyways in that scene you don't do that 
I think that's why he's still a draw all these years later. There was the time where, as we were saying, like his over the top acting style, and then it became like a thing for like hipsters and, you know, the John Travolta shirt that says Nick Cage under it. <laughs> he had all the direct to video movies, and he's had a resurgence. A uh, large part of that is a lot of horror movies now, which lend well to, you know, going for it. You're just drawn to him, and like he does choices, little things. Like in every movie, he's going for it. He's not, this isn't a show or anything. As Brian De Palma said in an interview at the time, they're both artists and they want to make the best movie possible. I think a lot of the persona got caught up in writings, and you know, I mean, some of the performances are over the top. And again, what's so great about this film, it starts so over the top, as you were saying, Jared, and then it becomes this layered, nuanced performance at the end. This is a great showcase for him as an actor. You mentioned the little cage flourishes that he brings to the table, and it's something I caught when I just watched it recently. I would bet money is a cage flourish that he just did on the spot or whatever, but he walks into Tyler, the boxer's room, and he looks over at the, is it a lion's head on the wall? Mm-hmm, yeah. Cage just goes under his breath. <laughs> <laughs> And then he moves on. Uh, and I'm like, that wasn't in the script. I've always wanted to watch people direct Nicolas Cage because you'll get him in three different movies for six different movies in one year. One movie's like Pig. You're like, oh, this is great, right? And then you'll get some other movie and you're like, wow, Nicolas Cage is just like, you can't rein him in on this one. It's just fascinating. Like, how does that work? Does he test people early to see what he can get away with? Or does he just show up and he's like, I'm doing it this way? Or and in other movies, he's more collaborative. I don't know. It's just fascinating. I have a sense he judges you on how artistic you are. And if you're super artistic and you true heart of an artist, then he'll he'll listen to you. Otherwise, he'll just find it in. It's something I always think about this movie. It's not that I want the movie to be any more convoluted. I just find like this conspiracy that it comes down to about her being a whistleblower, basically, to these missile weapons that are being sold that don't actually work. My mind never really stays focused on that. Like To me, it's just filler conspiracy. You know, it's not like a mind blower of a reveal or anything. In the pantheon of conspiracy movies, when it's about uncovering what's really going on, this isn't anything that memorable. It's just seeing how it all connects, the different perspectives, the camera work, the character study, in a sense. It's all that stuff that still makes this movie memorable to me, but I just find the actual core conspiracy is kind of just B-movie insert conspiracy. Speaking of which, written by David Kep, who's pretty prolific. Yeah, I think with this movie, filmmaking is on display. The filmmaking language, style, technique, that's like the main show. I think everything post Mission Impossible, specifically this film, it's kind of like you have old style, very vintage style filmmaking with all of the Hitchcock's influences on De Palma, but you have it in a modern setting with modern actors. It feels like an older classic film, perhaps from the 60s, but it's in 1998 at a uh, boxing match. It's fascinating to think about and look at. Watching this film, there's two things that really struck me. When the shooting breaks out in the arena, I mean, Columbine was, what, 95, a couple of years prior to that? These things actually happen all the time. So that whole sequence, uh, when the shooting starts happening and everybody's running out of there, that hits a lot harder for me nowadays. And when Cage is looking at all the cameras with the, uh, I forget his name, but he's a wonderful character actor, but he's uh, looking at all the cameras. Obviously, surveillance is happening and there's cameras and that in these kind of events. But now we're living in this hyper surveillance world. So I think the film was kind of ahead of its time on that. Where, like, he zooms into that dude's driver's license, get his name, phones up the desk, and asks what rooms this guy's staying in. You're thinking of Mike Starr. Yeah, he's a great character actor. Thanks. When I look at him, I think Dumb and Dumber. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, he's done a ton of work, but, like, yeah, Dumb and Dumber. Stop! Stop! Uh, is what, what I think of. <laughs> stop it! He's another guy that can, like, go from zero to 60. To what you're saying, Rob, I think, yeah, there's this other layer to this movie that's also just ahead of its time in being commentary or satire on the media. In the opening, when you have the broadcaster and she's outside, the storm is starting, and she's calling it a hurricane, and they're telling her to dumb it down. To a tropical storm. It's a very Jaws moment. Don't close the beaches. We need the beaches open. But she's got that line where it's like, I love this town. We even spin the weather. I love that whole bit as well, because it's also telling us as an audience, like, you don't know what's going to be true. There is that through line of cameras filming cameras. It's just, what are you looking at? What is the actual reality of things here? 
Yeah, this film's like 15 years ahead of its time. I'm certain that if this movie came out today, it would get all the praise. But back in 98, it was just considered, oh, that's De Palma doing De Palma. You know, it's just a generic thriller. Cage was very known for doing these annual summer blockbusters at that point. So I think they really wanted this to be a big blockbuster hit. It was certainly marketed. Like, I remember seeing trailers for this movie in front of every movie I saw. If it was released as a blockbuster today, I think it'd be considered like high art. It has such an auteur touch to it. Like De Palma is definitely an auteur and he definitely has a a style. There are only a handful of directors these days, maybe less than a handful, that have a style to where you watch their film and you go, oh yeah, this is this director. There's a couple of things I really dig about Gary Sinise in this movie. For most of the movie, he's, you know, we're like, okay, this guy's caught up in these events. He's in the Navy. He, you know, he's a good dude. Then, of course, we learn that he isn't. But across those other movies, Gary Sinise is one of these actors that can... Like, he's a guy that... He's your friend. You show up at the bar, you're going to have a beer with him, right? He has that face. But then when it turns in the movie, and you can see how menacing he is. So I think that's just a fascinating quality as an actor. Way later in the picture, when he is telling Rick, his childhood buddy, like his motivation for uh, being caught up in these events... Where he talks about he was on a ship and the Iraqis blasted a missile through it. And then he was given the order to seal the uh, ship so it didn't sink. And 28 sailors were in there and they're all drowning. And he asked Rick, do you know what that sounds like when men are drowning? And he's telling this elaborate story. It fascinates me is he knows the missiles don't work. Because for me, I always thought, okay, it's an arms deal and it's all about greed. But he's spinning this story that it's, no, it's to save people. So again, it's this, you're caught up in the story. It's horrific. But I love it because for me, I'm like, was that story even true? Or it was true and it's his motivation, but it's all about greed because he knows these missiles don't work. Just a comment on Gary Sinise. You say Gary Sinise is a guy that you could have a beer with. Growing up, Gary Sinise was Lieutenant Dan for me. So he was always scary to me. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like, oh, shit. (laughs) Gary Sinise is always going to be the villain in my eyes. He used me. Made me a sucker. And that hurts me, because I would have done anything for you. Then tell me where the girl is. She didn't do nothing wrong. She was just trying to save some guys' lives, soldiers, like you used to be. I mean, who who the hell are you now, anyway? Don't talk to me about soldiers. What do you know about being a good soldier? A guy who finds an envelope full of cash in his squad car every Friday? What do you think I've been doing for the last 10 years? Strutting on the boardwalk and picking up hookers? His reveal of him being, for lack of a better word, one of the villains in this story, it's cool because it's not just like a dumb gotcha moment, you know, I'm the bad guy. I like how you get that reveal and then you get to spend the rest of the movie with that character change. But I just think because it's not played for like this cheap twist right at the end and you actually spend time with the character in his true shoes, it feels more organic. The reveal is just the changing of a lens. Right, exactly. And then you continue to experience this world with different, like your rose-colored glasses are taken off. This guy is not the guy you're trying to protect. He goes from being like tragic innocent to being the antagonist. You said, lack of a better word, the main threat. I think he is the main threat because he's the guy who is stopping the protagonist from doing his job. It's not cheap. I agree with you 100% there. It's just like, this is just a changing of vision. They do a good job, I think, of really selling their friendship because even Gary Sinise, like he has so many opportunities to kill Cage, but he doesn't. I just think the movie makes a point to really give you breathing time to be like, yes, there is still that friendship. Everything else could be a fucking lie here and you don't know what's what there, but their friendship, that is a real thing of the past and it still plays into the present with their dynamic. All you gotta do is be consistent for Christ's sake. Do what you always do, take the money. You wanna be a hero? You wanna do something for your country? Then tell me where the girl is. anybody but me, you'd be dead. 
we all have like a childhood friend that we know that we've been through a hell of a lot of shit with too that you would well not take it to that extreme hopefully but you know <laughs> well i just keep thinking of john hurd who plays such an excellent sleazeball but i keep thinking of his side character the owner of the casino he's got the classic bad guy speeches in those scenes with gary sinise like he's conducting a very dangerous investigation here reading about other reactions to this film the ending has been maligned mm. when i looked at the ending today it was like different threads playing out and the storm is culminating it's now going to take its full brunt One thing I found fascinating was originally they were actually going to have like a tidal wave or a tsunami wave hit and then wipe out everything. And then that got axed. They actually filmed it, I believe. And then uh, test audience is like, what is this? Just to comment on that, Rob, I think that's actually in the De Palma documentary. Oh, okay, cool. And then I just, I love the Millennium Ball of this giant symbol. And whether it was intentional or unintentional, I have to think it's somewhat intentional. It's the world. So, of course... Any uh, person who's steeped in cinema and watching other Brian De Palma movies, you're immediately going to go to Tony Montana and the World Is Yours globe. This giant globe that's now menacing the TV crew and Rick and Julia and the police and Gary Sinise's character. I mean, this thing's going to be rolling down at them. So I immediately thought the world is yours. I just love all the buildup before all that. Cage, he's got the, the shit kicked out of him by Tyler, the boxer. Yeah, that's brutal. Just the whole bit of him getting up after that, and they've got the tracking device on him, so Gary Sinise is following Cage back to Julia. Oh, that's great. Cage just beaten to shit, limping down the hallway. He could barely talk. He's kind of just like mumbling. And then outside later, he's protecting Julia, and Gary Sinise is put into a corner, and Cage is like, you got snake eyes, but he's just mumbling it. I love following a character once they've been through the ringer and they're just giving it their all on, on like their last effort to just fight the good fight. Ain't no way, Kevin! You got snake eyes! That's another thing what makes this movie great is most movies are going to end after that, especially that line, right? Yeah. However, we get to see the rise and fall of Rick as the local police. He's on stage. He's awarded a medal. He becomes the talk of the town. Everybody loves him. And as Gary Sinise said to him earlier, if you go down this path, you're going to lose all of this stuff. You're going to lose your wife. You're going to lose your kid. You're going to lose your house. You're going to lose your mistress. You're going to lose that apartment. You're going to lose everything. You're going to lose your name. And then it it all comes true. They start digging around. Who's this Rick guy? I love when he comes out of the house. I felt like that was just Nick Cage coming out of his house. (laughs) And then they confront him. like, And he's getting into this high-end sports car. And talking about cocaine and that. He's like, oh, whatever. It didn't happen. And then you see the rise and fall. He's going to court. He gets 12 to 18 months. I thought it was amazing that in most films, it's just going to end like this guy had this arc and okay, cool movie over, go home. But Nick Cage, I mean, he is a corrupt cop and I loved how that thread played out at the end. And there's hope. I mean, Carla shows up. uh, She's like, oh, I I was told one of the reporters told me where you're at. There's hope that after he does this time in jail, there will be this other life for Rick waiting on the other side of it. And then it's just more commentary about ruthfulness of the media. Even his so-called, his old pal Lou is the reporter chasing him at the end to get the story about his downfall. That was a nice touch. Random tidbit about that. Gary Sinise's character is named Kevin Dunn. That actor playing Lou, the reporter, his actual name is Kevin Dunn. I wonder if he looked at the script and said, hey. Well, he has a great line with Nick Cage earlier in the film. Rick's kicking all the reporters out of the arena. He's taking control of the crime scene. He's like, get out, get out. And he's like, well, come on. We go way back. Come on. I need a story. And then he agrees to let him set up just outside in the hallway. And he's like, look, this is how Dan Rather got to start with the JFK assassination, which ties back into the assassination of this high-ranking political official. Yeah, and he uh, offers him five grand for an hour. Well, that's another great piece in this movie is that bloody $100 bill and how it floats through the whole movie. Because that $100 bill, I mean, that's another moment where Rick reflects, which goes back to when Nick Cage is like, why did you need me by your side? And he's like, well, one, I mean, I needed a cop to verify my story. Two, I know I could buy you off. And then Gary's trying to buy him off. $400,000, 500000 a million dollars? I'll give you a million dollars. You can do whatever you want with that. And then Nick Cage is looking on the floor, and what's sitting there, the bloody $100 bill is just sitting there. He could easily just take that money and walk away. That's what he's done his whole life. That's what Gary tells him. Why are you doing this? You've always done this. And then looking at the literal blood money and having this major moment of reflection while in the midst of this insanity is just great. 
before he notices the blood money, Gary sneezes a million, and Cage like he has to take out a cigarette. I don't think he would have given her up, but you could see that he's breaking. Yeah, because Gary Sinise is playing into his... His wildest dreams. Yeah, that's a great point. It is his wildest dreams. He's a hustler like anybody else in Atlantic City. You know, he's got a grift going on here, there, or wherever. He's shaking down Louis Guzman at the starting to get the money to pay for the bet on the fight. So what's all grifters and betters trying to do? They're trying to get that one big score. He's literally offering him the big score. But it is great, as you said. You don't feel like he's going to give her up. But he's pausing for a minute because now he's running through that scenario. He's like, yeah, what can I do with this money? Did you guys watch the entire end credit scene? I watched this movie like five, six months ago, just randomly put it on because I hadn't watched it in forever. And I did that time. Yeah, I cut it off. Julia leaves. Cage is standing there for a bit. He goes, well, at least I got to be on TV. And then he leaves. The credits start rolling. The music comes on. And the camera just stays focused on the construction workers just moving shit around like they're redoing the casino and all that. And then finally, the camera starts to zoom in. It's on a long lens. This construction worker's hand moves out of the frame and you see like a diamond or a jewel embedded into the side of the pillar in the cement. So that's, um, interpret that how you will. What does it mean? (laughs) There's a method to his madness, right? It's like, why the hell are we watching these construction workers? That's what's great about De Palma. He's a filmmaker that is showing you and telling you things and misdirecting you. He's kind of a magician in that way where... He's definitely doing things with a purpose. Yeah, I would say if there's a fault in De Palma, it's being (laughs) overpurposed. Fair enough. I can concede that. This is what I love about doing this this show with you is that you guys turn me on to some films that I don't think I would have seen. Snake Eyes is not like some hidden indie thing, but it's kind of like an artifact from the past that I might have glanced over due to my thoughts on Brian De Palma's work. It's a nice surprise to have come across something that was so much fun to watch. Yeah, with Snake Eyes, I just think, I mean, one, I've said it before, but time has been kind to this movie. It only elevates it by comparison to the movies, a lot of the movies we get today. But I just think De Palma is at the top of his game. His direction and cinematography is masterful. I have no problem saying that. Part of it is the Nicolas Cage show, and it's just glorious to watch. It's just a good old-fashioned adult B-movie thriller and exceptionally well-made. This film, uh, as I uh, said earlier, I've, this film is 15, 20 years ahead of its time. Criticism that has been leveled at this film is, uh, well, the plot's so convoluted. This, uh, whatever, arms deals and boxing matches being fixed. And then I'm literally watching crazy real politics stuff happening in real time. And I'm like, well, here we go. I mean, I feel like this movie, is, uh, to agree with Jared 100%, if this film was made and released like this year, everybody would be like, man, this film's amazing. <laughs> Do you want to keep keep it going with a with a cage kick, or should we uh, do? We're doing chain reaction next, right? I'm I'm down to do it. Yeah, I mean, Rob, you purchased it, so let's. Uh... <laughs> so yeah. sorry, Rob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? <laughs> Fuck you. You want to buy the movie? You're not dictating what's next. You know what? We'll get to that whenever, man. No, no, no. I just saw it for cheap. I'm like, uh, I've never seen the movie. Whatever. I'll check it out. I mean, it's in it's in my Blu-ray collection, but I'm biased already. Thank you.